All right, thank you all so much for being here this afternoon. Um, we're really excited for you to learn a little bit more about contemplation and confrontation. My name is June Black. I am the Associate Curator for Academic Programs here at the museum, and it has been my distinct pleasure to work with China over the last um, year and a bit. So I'm gonna give a brief introduction, and then I will let her take it away. Uh, China earned a Bachelor of Arts in Art History from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, where she wrote her undergraduate thesis on a print by James Gilray, and she'll be talking about Gilray later today. Um, while in Minneapolis, she interned for two years at the Walker Art Center. China is now in her second year of her graduate studies in the Department of the History of Art and Architecture here at the University of Oregon. She's writing her graduate thesis on the fictive monuments of James Gilray and George Cruikshank. Specifically, her research focuses on Gilray's print of 1800 called Design for the Naval Pillar and Cruikshank's print of 1815 called A View of the Grand Triumphal Pillar. China's work reevaluates these fictive monuments as criticizing both the French and British governments. The thesis also deals with the publisher of these prints, Hannah Humphreys, and her distribution methods, which I think you may talk a little bit about today, perhaps. Um, China is actively involved in the Art History Association, where she is the Publicity and Communications Chair, and she is also one of our most accomplished interns at the museum. She's my intern, so I can brag on her. Um, she has um, been working with me for the last year and a half about and has done a tremendous amount of research and writing. So many of the interpretive wall labels that you see on the museum walls have been done by China. Um, she has also written uh, essays for exhibition catalogs, um, one for uh, one that Miss Akiko Wally did, Professor Wally. Um, so a great project that she just finished and if you're interested in looking at those prints, they're on view in our Barker Gallery right now, which is uh, just that way. So uh, without any further ado, I will introduce China, and thank you all again for uh, joining us, so please join me in welcoming her. Um, so first I'd like to say thank you to June, and then also Jody and Jill, and kind of everybody who helped um, had any part of this exhibition. Um, I don't think university art museums usually present this kind of opportunity to students. Um, so I'm really fortunate that they let me do this. Um, so th we named the exhibition uh, Contemplation and Confrontation to reflect the sweeping political and societal changes that happened through Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and how artists in their works were not only symbolically confronting and contemplating these changes, but also physically showing confrontation and contemplation in their works, which we'll talk about um, when we go through some of the works. Um, the ex exhibition focus on, focuses on five artists, uh, William Hogarth, James Gilray, uh, Francisco Goya, Paul Gavarni, and Henri Dam Damnier. Um, and the exhibition as a whole offers a unique lens through which to view these prints um, and to view them in the decline of the European aristocracy, the rise of the middle class and the changing attitudes about the church and morality. Um, so we'll first look at William Hogarth's series, The Stages of Cruelty. Uh, Hogarth is best known for his moral subjects, um, but he did um, also do a series of portraits. Uh, he started engraving in about 1710 after he was apprenticing as a goldsmith. Um, and his Stages of Cruelty, um, through his, we know through his autobiographical notes were an attempt to highlight the cruelty of animals in the streets of London. Um, but as we'll see, it kind of goes into the human realm of cruelty as well. Um, he originally wanted them to be done in engravings so that more um, of the lower classes could afford them. But after doing a couple of series um, with engravings, or with woodblock prints, he decided that engraving would offer a higher level of detail and decided to do um, the remaining series uh, prints in engraving. So it tracks the fictional life of, the, of Tom Nero, whose name is a pun on the Latin word for black, and is also a pun on the uh, cruel Roman emperor Nero. Um, so in the first stage, we have Nero as a youth, um, and specifically just the cruelty of animals. So if you, if you can take a close look, um, they put wings on a cat and throw it out the window, they hang two cats by their tails, and they fight each other, and then also a dog um, gets a bone tied through his, to his tail uh, and among other things that go on in here. 
Um, but Nero is the one who inflicts the, the most pain. He pushes an arrow through a dog. Um, and there is a, a, a child right here who draws him hanging, which is a foreshadow of his demise and how these cruel acts will eventually cause his death. Um, so if we, we, we go into the second stage of cruelty and we see that the cruelty of animals has spread to the larger, um, wider streets of London. So Nero is shown here in the front as a young adult um, beating his horse. He's a carriageman and his carriage has capsized with these four lawyers who are trying to escape and he's beating the horse. Um, so we also see in the back there is a sign for uh, Broughton's Amphitheater, which was a popular boxing venue. Um, so Hogarth here is establishing an interrelationship between violent sports and entertainment um, and criminality. And then this also begins to affect not only animals, but humans. Um, if you look closely, there is a sleeping man on a cart who is about to run over a child who has fallen. Um, so this is kind of the first site of cruelty um, towards humans. And then if we move towards the uh, cruelty and perfection, it has fully gone into the human realm. And um, his cruel tendencies have now led to murder. And he's depicted in a more grotesque nature um, to convey his inherent vi vi violentness, viciousness, um, and his character and his brutalizing ways of life. Um, so he has killed his mistress, um, or his girlfriend, pregnant girlfriend, Anne Gill, who he convinced to steal from his mistress. She was a servant. Um, and when she returns with the things she has stolen, he takes them for himself and he slits her throat. Um, so she is here, she's here lying, you can see her with her, uh, not only her neck is slit, but her arm or her hands at her wrists are slit. And her finger points towards an open book that reads, God's Revenge Against Murder. So this is also another foreshadowing technique um, by Hogarth to show how um, he will evident, or will be uh, eventually punished for this act. Um, and a mob of farmers come in and apprehend him for his crimes, which he will be trialed and executed for. So lastly, we see um, in the reward of cruelty, uh, Nero has been executed, and he, um, his cadaver is presented on an autonomous dissection table um, in the terms of, or for the service of science. And um, during the 18th century, having your body dedicated towards science was kind of something that only the lowest um, of the people got, uh, the criminals. It wasn't kind of regarded as a good thing as it is today. Um, so the roles of abuser and abused have now been reversed. And the, or the, the um, chief surgeon who resembles a judge pokes down at him with a long rod, which kind of is a visual parallel to how Nero treats a dog in the first print. Um, so there's those roles also uh, reversed between the dog and Nero because as Nero is dead on the table, he, um, the dog is now gnawing on his heart which has fallen on the ground. Um, so this series overall, um, the overall moral is that cruel children, if left unchecked by society, will become cruel adults. Um, and Hogarth su suggests that this is a natural progress progression um, from Nero's abuse to animals and then to humans. Um, and that is um, belatedly uh, um, the establishment intervenes. Um, so we'll move just to show another aspect of Hogarth's um, career. He also critiqued um, the parliamentary system um, and specifically in this print, the five orators of the periwigs, um, he's mocking the royal establishments and their wigs. So he um, mocks them by uh, insulting them simultaneously insulting them with architectural vocabulary. Um, so he labels them in categories that play on the most complex and ornate forms of architectural orders. Um, and that's just to show how he did this, not only with the kind of the cruel, but also with you know, the ornateness of the um, king and the queen, which is something that James Gilray focuses on pretty much in the majority of his prints. Um, he's best known for his political and social satires from the latter part of King George III's reign. Um, he initially tried to be a historical painter, but realized when he was doing his work that his figures always contained some sort of uh, caricature, characterized aspect. Um, so he is uh, decided to go head in with um, caricature. 
Um, so this print shows the Sec Secretary of State Henry Dundas, the Prime Minister William Pitt the Younger, and then the Lord Chancellor Edwin Thurlow depicted as sisters who gaze um, at the moon, showing the profiles of Queen Charlotte and then King uh, George III. And it is based on a print, or by a painting by Henry Fusley, which is down here, um, from 1793, called the, the Three Witches or the Weird Sisters, um, which depicts the fortune-telling witches in Shakespeare's Macbeth. And Gilroy even um, includes at the bottom of, it, of the image a line from Act One, Scene Three of Macbeth. Um, so rather than looking towards the future, as Henry's, or Fusley's, which is uh, due, um, Gilroy's figures ponder the indicative presence and the current reign of George III, who was believed to be going mad. Um, and the bulk of, the bulk of Gilroy's prints at this time kind of critique not only uh, King George, but his um, cabinet as well. Um, so he's drawing on uh, Fusli's painting, which he does in a lot of other examples of his prints, to kind of elevate caricature to a higher level of art, because it wasn't considered um, as high of an art form as painting was, um, which he you know, tried to do, but kind of found his niche here. Um, so yeah, we will move over to um, the Francisco Goya pieces. Um, Goya is regarded as the most important Spanish painter of the late 18th and 19, early 19th centuries. Um, and he worked in all mediums and was a royal court painter. Um, so his work, I think, is especially interesting because he not only worked for the court, but he also criticizes them um, in his prints. So these, all three of these prints come from his series, Los Caprichos, which uh, was a series of 80 prints that mocked the superstitions of peasantry, the arrogance of the nobility, and then the widespread corruption of the Catholic Church. Um, so this first print, No I Can No Stisset, <laughs> which translates into um, Is There No One To Antaeus, is a critique of the church. And um, it's one of the last prints in the series and is commenting on the arranged marriages in Spanish wealthy families. Um, so the couple here is bound together by a rope and they're kind of struggling against each other but they can't be, they can't be freed. Um, and their inability to split from one another, uh, one another represents the inescapability of arranged marriages. Um, and this owl above wearing glasses um, and gripping the head of the woman is uh, symbolizing the power of the church and the Spanish crown um, over the people. So they're not only struggling against each other and marriage, but they're also struggling against the greater forces of society. Um, so also in this print series, um, Goya created this work, um, Que Vien El Coco, which translates to Here Comes the Boogeyman. Um, and he was criticizing the two-faced nature of women at this time. So it was a common tale by adulterous women that they would tell their children um, that their lover was the boogeyman um, in order to scare them. Um, so this allowed women to keep their secret and not being bothered by children. So in the print, the mother's expression um, contrasts her children. She has a slight smile while her children are cowering in fear. Um, and the light, lighting in this print is strategically done to highlight their faces while her face and then obviously the face um, of the boogeyman <laughs> is um, hidden. Um, so this is overall cr criticizing the, cri uh, the um, use of fear to keep children well, well behaved. Um, so, and the, the Gilray and, or, I'm sorry, the Goya and the Hogarths actually um, go really well across from each other because it's kind of showing how um, they're both critiquing society and kind of the cruel, cruel, cruelness or the you know, immoral behaviors um, of them happening in England and also in Spain. So, we'll go over to France. <laughs> um, so, Henri Damier is considered the Michelangelo of caricature. Um, he was um, active during the 19th century, um, and he produced thousands of lithographs and woodcuts, uh, numerous drawings, and then sculptures. But he is most known for his satirical prints. Um, he did this print series called Les Bons Bourgeois, Bourgeois um, created from 1846 to 1849. Um, and it uh, chronicled the lives of the middle class Parisians. Um, so in this first print, um, a nouvelle homme, I'm so bad at French. So 
translates to um, the obligatory New Year visit um, to Aunt Rabordan. Um, so we see her standing right here in front of her portrait and just kind of smugly greeting her family while her nephew is down with, here with the same kind of grimacing look, um, suggesting that um, in the future he will take her place and be this kind of smug adult bourgeoisie individual, um, perhaps like um, this one in um, the one that translates to uh, he has become the landlord. This smug bourgeoisie man is um, staring down at this elderly lady whose home he has just acquired. Um, so kind of talking about the, uh, the uh, selfishness of the bourgeoisie and the, the smugness of them. Um, and Damier not only did this with the bourgeoisie um, in regards to actions like this in the home, um, but also to the art scene. Um, so in this one, which translates to my wife has asked me to have my portrait taken when I'm in Paris, He's uh, mocking the greed and the ignorance of the bourgeoisie when it comes to the art market. Um, so these two men here are, are, are at an art market, um, and there is a kind of caption to what is going on. And um, it tells us that he has been sent by his wife to get a portrait done of him, but rather than commissioning a whole new one, he plans to save money and um, put his face on the head of an old portrait. Um, and paint over it. So um, the same kind of thing is going on also with this one, um, which translates to, oh, it's wonderful, um, where this man with this bulbous head is looking towards um, a portrait being done by this woman with the same uh, physical features as him. And the caption states um, that despite the, the mouth, nose, and eyes, the painting bears a remarkable resemblance. So, <laughs> um, Ho or Damnier is also kind of criticizing his you know, lack of the arts because he positions him very close to the painting, yes, yet he is squinting with a monocle. And he is also, has, he's put his hat over a um, sculpture. So um, talking about how these, or how the members of the bourgeoisie um, claim that they know all about this high art, but yet kind of treat it in this way that they don't really know what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> So um, overall, the etching of these works, or the medium in these works, are primarily done in etching and engraving. But lithography, as Damnier, Damnier used, um, became the chief medium for political and uh, journalistic imagery in the 19th century. Um, lithos could be printed in almost in un unlimited quantities. Um, and a lot of these images were inserted in publications, weekly satirical journals, and newspapers. Um, so they needed that to get it out, so they would have been wise, widespread and seen through um, an abundance of classes. Um, lithos make um, Damier's drawing, or prints look a little more like drawing because they're used with a greasy crayon on top of a, a, a stone slab, so there's kind of a little bit more fluidity in the work of Damier than as opposed to the, uh, the etchings or engravings of Hogarth. Um, so these illustrated magazines and newspapers that these were included in were uh, replacing the print shops um, of the 18th century uh, where works like Gilray's would have been um, exhibited. Um, and so that just allowed you know, more people to be access, to have ac access to these prints um, as opposed to having to walk by a specific gallery or print shop. Um, they could receive these in there. Um, in their newspapers and at home. So that was really fast. But um, d if anybody has any questions, I can answer some questions. I was interested in the uh, decorative, yeah. uh, I don't know, signatures, and I can't tell what else around this New Year's visit. Can yeah. you explain a little bit more about that? So we tried to look into these, and in there are very few instances where he does this, so um, I'm not sure exactly what they say or what they mean, um, but I think they kind of add to the image. I think it makes it a little more interesting um, having these kind of notations. I don't necessarily know what the, I think this might be Robert in, but it's, I, I can't really tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get in serious trouble with their governments or 
Um, I, <laughs> no, I, at this time, not really any of these artists that are focused got in too much trouble. Usually it was just the publications that were, um, that got reprimanded for producing these images. Um, so the Garvani print, which is behind you right there that we didn't talk about, um, originally his prints were all in this one magazine um, that got shut down because the government didn't like the images that were being produced, so he um, printed them himself and distributed them himself. Um, but none of these artists that I know of got in too much serious trouble for um, this, which isn't the case with all artists. There have been some that, yeah, get jailed and <laughs> work gets destroyed, but not, not so much in this case. They seem pretty um, explicit on their criticism. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just to, that, just to take up on that, that's kind of interesting that Boya painted for the court, yeah. but then also turned around and kind of bit the hand that was yeah, yeah, and, yeah, that exactly. they, and that they just continue to support him, that just seems unlikely. Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know if they continue to support him after he started doing this. Um, I well, there's, a, you know, there are different bodies of work, especially with Goya, so the paintings that he was doing for the royalty would have been seen by those individuals, and for example, there are several printings of the Caprichos, um, so I don't know that it's terribly likely that they were particularly aware of everything that he was doing. Um, so, yeah. You mean because they were so isolated in the court? Well, and I don't think he was necessarily advertising no. yeah. this particular part of his output to the Yeah, I, I believe that this series was printed posthumously. The Caprichos? Or was it disaster? Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, but like Gilray, he, um, you know, he criticized a lot of different people in his um, pr prints, such as the Prince of Wales. Um, and it is actually in record that the Prince of Wales bought some of his prints. Um, so I think that even even though he was kind of doing these really negative commentaries on the actions of these people, they, his his work was popular enough that ones that didn't do that, uh, like higher members of the aristocracy, were purchasing them. So that's, I think that one's really interesting personally. <laughs> but I like Gallery, so yeah. Uh, I was noticing that the Hogarth series of prints has uh, like a chronological narrative in the most text mm -hmm. uh, in each caption. Whereas some of the later ones are more um, like self-contained and more picture oriented. And I'm wondering if, even though it's just a small sampling, if there's maybe some sort of trend as time goes on where prints get sort of more uh, confident in themselves, so it's just the print itself as opposed to sort of being supported with text? Yeah, because um, I know that Hogarth does, uh, does this a lot. Um, he includes a lot of uh, text excerpts at the bottom of his images. Um, Gilray and Cruikshank and Rowlandson and the Golden Age of Character um, in British satire, um, which was the, like the late 18th century, early 19th century, do that a little bit, but not to the same extent. Um, but yeah, you definitely see a trend um, of them kind of being image only, and especially um, when these images were being uh, included in satirical weekly journals and newspapers, they wouldn't need to have that same you know amount of text because there would probably be something in the magazine yeah. kind of referring to it. Um, but yeah, that's a really good observation. Yeah, yeah I was wondering about the, the one Hogarth in particular where the carriages overturned and they're promoting the boxers in the back and it said in the notes that the boxer was arrested as a highwayman. Yeah. And so where would that have been published and would that have been a common knowledge that they he that was, would have been uh, published in just the newspapers, I believe. And um, so would everybody have been aware that that was the message of the painting? Or? Um, I think that people who were aware of the situation with the boxers um, would have been, um, would have noticed that that was strategically placed in the background of the print and would have connected that um, visually. Um, but again, you know, some of the people who are, these prints were made for at least for the lower class and probably did not have the same you know, resources to be aware of this kind of activity that was going on. Um, but I do think that it would have been recognized. Well, it's kind of the same thing with, you know, the political cartoons that we see in the New Yorker or in the newspapers or whatever, you know, those are very easily decoded for us because we understand what's going on in the contemporary sort of news situation. Um, so I think it's, it's the same thing, but which mm -hmm. makes these pieces really interesting because of course we have to do a lot of digging to understand the socio-political context of, of the critiques that are happening here. Um, but, but yeah, I think the classes or the, the individuals who were immediately you know, seeing these in their time would have been 
aware of all these little nuances, some of which we may not be able to decode at this point. So I think they probably would have picked up on that. Um, and also too, you know, these are really interesting to consider in their own historical context too, because of course in the 21st century we are flooded with images. And these, I think, would have had a much, um, you know, been more impactful to the people who were encountering them. Um, and that was sort of one of the great things in, um, about prints and how they dem um, democratized images for everyone. Um, so in just interesting points to kind of keep in mind when you're looking at these, these prints. Now, me and I had a question about the final Hogarth print in the series yeah. about cruelty where the dissection is taking place. And you use the rather uh, airy phrase, dedicating one's uh, corpse or body to science. Yeah. And uh, you indicated, though, that it was not quite uh, the thing to do for the middle and upper classes. Yeah. So my question would be, was this a sort of punishment, judicial punishment? And was it imposed before? the person actually died, or was this a way to humiliate the remains and make an example for the onlookers? Or yeah, um, it, it, it's normally criminals, um, well, a large, a large amount of criminals who were um, subjected to that kind of afterlife, or that, you know, it, they weren't buried, they were um, rather kind of, you know, picked apart, which wasn't seen as a, as a good thing um, at the time. So, um, yeah. Um, well, and it had a great deal to do with the religious context, right. too. So, uh, particularly within the English church, the ideas about the afterlife and what one's body should be like, and, you know, of course, um, what's it called? Um, crematoriums? Cremation yes. was definitely not in vogue um, yeah. at this time at all, because one's body was supposed to you know, be able to go into heaven. Um, so yeah, it, it was definitely something that was looked down upon and reserved for, as China was saying, criminals. So I think it had much more to do with the religious context. So I have a question. I, I was really intrigued by your work on um, about how the role of abuser and abused switched. Yeah. And um, sort of going off on that, are these artists, were these artists criticizing everybody? Or do they have a principle that they want to criticize certain people? Um, yeah, um, I think a pretty common trend among all satirical prints is that they're, you know, criticizing the upper classes and um, negative things that happen within the governmental systems. Um, and if if they see a king or a queen reigning poorly, they're going to comment on that in prints, um, which is what a lot of um, kind of a study trend. I mean, we still see that today with, you know, characterists, um, you know, critiquing like Obama or, you know, Donald Trump. Um, so <laughs> um, I think that it was, uh, for the most part, kind of, you know, highlighting the injustice of the lower class compared to these bourgeoisie activities. Um, and then also just the, you know, the negative ruling of pol politicians that were viewed as unfavorable. <laughs> Well, thank you all so thank much for coming. Thank you.